Hello and welcome to Geek History Lesson. I'm Ashley Victoria Robinson. And I'm Jason Draxamillion Inman. Welcome to your mind university because Geek History Lesson is the podcast where we take one character from pop culture or movies and we explain them to you in about an hour. Today it's a team. It's a team that we all have been waiting a long, 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 long time to see, specifically two years, but we've been waiting a long time and their movie is exploding into theaters very soon. Mm -hmm. Ashley, who are we talking about? We're talking about the Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, this should be a fun one. We've done uh, Star-Lord in the past. We did Rocket. We did Rocket Raccoon in the past, mm -hmm. but we've never done the team we have Guardians not. of the Galaxy. And, uh, it and we have many requests for the other characters in the team, but specifically the team was requested by The Geek Out on Tumblr. So oh. thank you so much for your request, and you are the TA of this week's episode. I hope you geek out on this episode. Me too. All right. So how about we move into the very first section of this podcast called the, the I almost wanted to call it the Meet Cute. I was moving forward in, in time travel and dimensions, but actually- <laughs> It's the Ten Cent origin, where we're going to explain to you basically a Cliff Notes version of the origin of the Guardians of the Galaxy. So in case you go to nowhere and you're talking to Cosmo and I ask you, "Hey, where do these guys come from?" and you can be like, "Look, let me tell you." Oh man, Cosmo's a good pull. So the Guardians of the Galaxy are, of course, a Marvel comic super team. They first appeared in Marvel Super Heroes, that's Super Dash Heroes, number eighteen from January of 1969. And were created by Arnold Drake and Gene Colan. Now, note, this is not the team that you're thinking of if, like me, you only learned about them from the movie. This is the original team card go called Guardians of the Galaxy. Now, here's the Tencent origin from the team that we're all thinking of. They are also a Marvel Comics super team that first appeared in Annihilation colon Conquest number 6 from April of 2008. And they were created by Dan Abnett and Andy Lanning. And the team members have been so many in a bunch of different incarnations that I'm not going to list them here, but we will get into the details in the lesson proper. And yes, the two teams do cross over, which is why I'm bringing both of them up. And the second team famously appeared in the Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1 2014 movie that convinced everyone that they were actually cool. It's so interesting that they are not even 10 years old. They're not. Wow. They're a little baby team. They are a baby comic book team. All right, so let's now move into the meet cute. That's the section that I wanted to do first, but now we're going <laughs> to do it second. And this is a term that we stole from Rannick Comedies, where we tell you how we first meeted and cuted the Guardians of the Galaxy. Ashley, mm -hmm. I'm very curious about this because uh, usually your answer is Batman the Animated Series. You cannot yeah, say that well, this one. Well, that's a good answer. Uh, where did you first meet cute the Guardians of the Galaxy? So in the uh, bygone days of 2013, I was working at Blast Off Comics in North Hollywood, California, and somebody came in and said, hey, they're making a Guardians of the Galaxy movie. And I said, what's Guardians of the Galaxy? I was just about to say that, too. <laughs> and then uh, suddenly Marvel, like a month later, had a new comic book series to come out. And uh, I had to read it because I was working at the shop. <laughs> so that's where I first met. So you were like, it was the Brian Bendis uh, yeah, Guardians of the Galaxy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the one they launched after the movie or right before the right movie? Right before the Marvel Now series. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The 2013 series. Nice. So that's where I first <coughs> met and included uh, the GOTG. How about you? Um, well, to be honest with you, the first Guardians of the Galaxy that I remember is, I remember them popping up in the 90s in... Some issue I got at a pawn shop, some sort of Spider-Man Avengers comic book, mm -hmm. and it's the weirdo team of the the Guardians of the Galaxy. Like, it's not the movie team, yeah, but they're yeah, called yeah. the Guardians of the Galaxy, and I can't remember the character whose name, because I remember reading this comic book, the Guardians showed up, and me as a kid being like, wow, they're real confusing. Like, yeah. even as a kid, I was like, I don't know what they are, because it had the guy that... Who has the? He has the body of the Starfield, but he holds the Captain America shield. Major victory. I don't know what his name is. I, I here's the thing. If if we bring him up, uh, you shout and you let us know. <laughs> sure, I don't know. Uh, I'll probably look him up while while you're talking. But like, here's the thing. He so little impressed me when I was a kid. Yeah. That I've never cared to even bother to look him up. I mean, I would hazard that that's why in uh, 2013 when they did the movie tie-in book. 
they pretty much just built the team that was going to be in the movie. Yeah. Uh, there are some other... Mantis shows up in that first arc. Yeah, yeah. Probably because they knew that she was planned for the second oh, movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that whole Brian My- Michael Bendis series is because he had advanced knowledge that movie yeah. was coming in. They... And it's all a giant hey, facelift for this a, team. It was a smart business move. But I met... I did read Annihilation mm-hmm. a couple years after it was published because I had heard that it was... A lot of people said it was really good. It was really good. I mean, for a cosmic um, event, it's pretty good. It's probably Marvel's best cosmic event. It yeah. really is. Um, and that Guardians team shows up in it. But I, I kind of like the Guardians of the Galaxy, to be honest with you, um, when they are a little weirder. Like, I really like the version of the team that's introduced and their costumes that are introduced in Annihilation. Mm-hmm. And I kind of miss that version of the Guardian. I kind of miss that now they look exactly like they do in the movies. And, like, I like the movie version just fine. Yeah. But I do like it when they're, like, a little bit weirder and not just copies of the movies mm-hmm. in the comic books anyway. Yeah. Uh, but not too weird like it was in the 90s when I couldn't understand it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, <laughs> that's where I first met cute uh, the Guardians. Cool. Uh, then let's move right into History 101, shall we? History 101 is the main meat in the lesson where Professor Ashley and her TA are going to teach you all about the Guardians of the Galaxy. All right, so as we usually do, I'm going to do a little bit of some production history for you before we jump into the fictional history. So the Guardians of the Galaxy were created to help fill out part of Marvel Superheroes number 18 and then made specific appearances after that until Uh, begging for characters like Captain America or the Defenders to help them in fighting their alien enemies, the Badoon. Now, Jason, do you know what the Badoon are? I don't, but I do know that they're they're, they're an alien species that are mentioned a lot around the Guardians Mm -hmm. Galaxy, and I believe they're mentioned in the movie as the aliens that supposedly steal... um, Aren't they the aliens that steal uh, Peter in the movie? Or am I wrong? They're mentioned a couple times in the they movie. They are. But they're basically like the Guardian's nemeses for yes. most of their series. So the Badoon are a fictional reptilian alien species uh, from Marvel Comics. They are notable for living under strict gender segregation, resulting in two separate societies, the Brotherhood of the Badoon that are ruled by a brother royal, and the Sisterhood of the Badoon that are ruled by a queen. They really, 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 really look like Skrulls. Uh, by the way, uh, just a quick uh, uh, segue into this podcast real quick. I looked up that character. You were correct. Major Victory, his <laughs> name is Vance Astro, that yeah, character that's that Starfield, name, yeah, yeah. Uh, and he holds Captain America's shield. Um, again, uh, my nine-year-old self was just like, this guy is weird, and I don't understand him. Yeah, it's funny that you bring up Captain America because he's basically Space Captain America. So let's talk about that and uh, these original Guardians real briefly. Okay. So, the Guardians of the Galaxy are actually from an alternate timeline known as Earth 691. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Strap in. This we, are, is, we are starting this in. This is the easy part. Oh, Lord. Um, and they were active during the 31st century. Does this sound Whoa. like the Legion of Superheroes to anybody? It's the exact same century. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. I'm, okay. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of similarities. Okay. Wow. Uh, original team members included Major Vance Astro, also known as Major Victory, who was a 20th century astronaut who hung around in the Alpha Centauri system in suspended animation until he was woken up. Oh, that makes sense. Uh, Martinix Tanaga, who was a crystalline being from Pluto. Captain Charlie 27, a soldier born on Jupiter. And Yondu Udanta, a, quote, noble savage, unquote, which is not politically correct to say anymore, from Centauri 4. Yondu... Um, <laughs> has been adapted into the character played by Michael Rooker in the movies. Yeah. yeah by the way, fun fact, uh, you're talking about the 31st century. Um, just to give point, the Legion was created in 1958. Um, that's when the 30th century, 31st century first appears. For the Guardian 69. For yeah. the Guardian 69. So Legion beats the this original version of Guardians by 11 years. Uh, yeah, so by a decade. So the thing that unites all of these different people is that each appears to be the last of their respective races, mm-hmm. making them all Superman, effectively. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, they reunite, or they unite, I'm sorry, against the Badoon, who are bent on conquering the Sol system, a.k.a. our solar system here on Oh, Earth. S-O-L. Not, S-O-L, yes. Not S-O-L, O-S-O-U-L. So the, 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 the Sol, Sol system. The Sol it's the Latin word system, for sun, baby. guys. <laughs> Welcome to Barry White's solar system. If you would like to request a Barry White geek history oh. lesson, please do so. Oh, mercy, mercy me. It's just going to be Jason's impression. Oh. <laughs> The Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> oh, that was good. That was good. Bring it back around. So while battling the Badoon, they add three new team members because 
that's who we need. Inclu- More confusion? <laughs> including uh, Starhawk and Alita. Who, I know Starhawk. Who are married and very mysterious. And a, a character named Nikki, N-I-K-K-I, who is a genetically engineered little girl from Mercury who left her planet in search of excitement. Is it? Uh, um, we're just going to assume that that's our Mercury. It is our Mercury. Oh, it it's is our, our Mercury. Jupiter. Okay, got it, got yeah, it, got yeah, it, yeah, 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 yeah. The, they are. Oh, it's a solar system. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, together, the fully formed gar- uh, Guardians travel back to the 20th century on Earth, where they go on a bunch of adventures with such heroes as Captain America and the ever-loving Thing. After a lot of brouhaha, the Guardians defeat the Badoon, only to find themselves facing off against a new alien foe called Korvac, who is a creation of the Badoon. So they didn't really defeat them after all. So, fighting Korvac takes them back to the 31st century. And in the 31st century, the Guardians team up with Thor in order to defeat Korvac. Because why not? And they follow Thor back to the 20th century. Immediately after that, to Earth-616, uh, where they battle some more Badoon by teaming up with the fully formed Avengers. It's a lot of back and forth through time. It is. For seemingly no reason. Ironically, during this time, Starhawk was trying to prevent time travel, lest it should cause the future and the team to become altered. And when these changes do eventually happen, Starhawk is the only person who ever knows about it and recognizes the differences. And every time the Guardians change something significant, a huge catastrophe immediately follows, usually at the hands of the Badoon. So Starhawk is trying to be the doctor and doing a terrible job at it. Yeah. Their next incarnation is several years in the future where they add even more members to the team, including all these people you've never heard of. They are the Legion. Wow. Yeah. The Inhuman Talon, the Skrull Replica, Yellow Jacket. Now, this is the second Yellow Jacket, who's Rita DeMara from the 21st century. Okay, okay. Um, And an old version of Simon Williams, who now calls himself Hollywood, comma, Man of Wonder. Yeah. Man of Wonder. Don't worry about it. All right. Right after that, Martinex left the Guardians in order to expand the brand into multiple organizations, and she founded a team called the Galactic Guardians. And that's everything of significance that happens with the original Guardians. Uh, You can pretty much forget about that, but remember that uh, Major Victory is a character. All that uh, Korvok stuff you're talking about, um, that is an Avenger storyline that's called the Korvok Saga. It is, yes. It's not that great. It's not. The most important thing is it's the first time the Avengers and the Guardians team Mm -hmm. up to fight this Badoon guy. But Major Victory uh, in the newest line of uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Marvel Legends has an action figure. Does he really? Yeah, yeah. He's in the new set. Well, I haven't looked at it, so I'm learning stuff too. Great. Uh, So now because we're effectively jumping into a different team, I'm going to go back again and talk a little bit about uh, development and production history just really briefly. Sure. uh, That led this Guardians team to be formed, you know, the one we're more familiar with. Are we going to get some Annihilation uh, production history a little bit? Oh, maybe we are. Ooh. Uh, So Dan Abnett and Andy Lanning had been pitching a new Guardians of the Galaxy reboot for some time, and they were finally allowed to in May of 2008, made up of cast members from Annihilation Conquest. Do you know what they're uh, writing? name is DNA yeah it's really cool yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did I was like yeah, yeah. are you trying to trick me no no I always I wanted I wanted our listeners to know about DNA yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, they also by the way wrote um, a really good Legion story <laughs> they uh, they they ran the second half of my favorite period of Legion of Superheroes and they started off with Legion Loss and they took yeah, over Legion the title Loss is good. Uh, called the Legion I, I, I love their run on the Legion and I kind of think it's probably the reason why because this was after that yes why they got the job doing it Annihilation and Guardians. So, Jason, uh, do you know what Annihilation Conquest is? Uh, Okay, okay. Um, It's tough. This is a hard event to explain. Um, You can basically just tell me what that that is a sequel, and I'll explain the event. Well, it's a sequel. I was going to say it's a sequel to the first Annihilation was... Where I, a nihilist wanted to destroy the universe with an annihilation wave. Mm-hmm. And it, through that, he destroyed the Nova Core, if I remember yes. right, and stuff like that. So there's only one Nova now. Annihilation Conquest, I think, is another wave, but it's something else. I can't so, remember. So, yes, it is a sequel to 2006's Annihilation that Jason just talked about. And the series, again, focuses on Marvel's cosmic heroes defending the universe against the Phalanx, which is now led by Ultron. Oh, the Phalanx. Yeah, Jason's favorite thing to mispronounce. Yeah, the Phalanx. Uh, Nova returns once again to a title role along with Quasar, Star-Lord. And this is Richie Ryder. It is, yep. yes. And a new character called Wraith. They also appear alongside Ronan the Accuser, Moondragon, Super Scroll. 
Carol, Gamora, Mantis, and Rocket Raccoon. And this event notably features the return of Adam Warlock to Marvel Comics continuity. Yeah. So Bill Roseman, who was the editor at the time on this new Guardians book, he was the person who had spearheaded reinventing the team as opposed to just redoing the original team. Yeah. Um, and had this to say about the decision to change the team. Quote, As the planning of Annihilation Conquest came together, it occurred to us that if things went well, there would be a group of characters left standing who would make for a very interesting and fun team. Unquote. So it's not that the first team was silly. It's not that they wanted to throw some more ladies on it. They were just like, these characters are kind of cool. We'll call them the Guardians. That actually, to be honest with you, I mean, I think that's great because that is a that is a great editor looking at his universe, mm-hmm. looking at an event and being like, you know, we have this title for a team that nobody's using right now. And these characters that kind of banded together in this event are kind of cool Let's meld the two. Exactly. And Annihilation That's a good Conquest, for, for whether or not it has stood the test of time, it sold pretty well. Uh, Annihilation Conquest is an okay sequel. Annihilation's the better storyline. For line, sure. But Annihilation Conquest is okay. It also provided the motivation for the team, uh, excuse me, that the team would need um, cause they did all been together in the conquest to band together. There's a reason for this. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's also like from an in-story point of view. Mm-hmm. I think it's it's a good choice as well. And, and just also out there for everybody, uh, if you don't know, like Drax before Annihilation is not the Drax in the movies at all. I mean, all. I would even hazard that Drax before the 2013 series yeah. is not the Drax from the movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's it's sort of like from Annihilation to the Brian Michael Bendis, they sort of meld him, they into, get him there, into the yeah. movie version. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so now let's jump back into all fictional history all the time. Yeah. So like I mentioned, the original team banded together to oppose the Phalanx conquest of the Kree system, and it was made up of Nova, Gamora, Phyla. Phyla is the name of this version of Quasar. Mm-hmm. I'm using her name because we're going to meet another version in a little bit, so that's okay. who Phyla is, yeah. uh, Rocket Raccoon, Star-Lord, and Mantis. Real quick, in case you don't know who the Falniks are, um, <laughs> they're like a golden techno-organic alien species. They're kind of like the Borg. They are like the Borg, yeah. but more bug-like. Mm. Uh, so Nova did not remain on the team, but he continued to work with them as a close ally and does to this, the new Nova does to this very day. Mm. Um, but and, when, this, and this Nova is back in the universe as well, by the way. Yes, now. finally. Nobody dies in comics, Ashley. Uh, I've heard that, you know. He recommended that the group uh, make the sp- space station known as Nowhere their base of operations, and that's no and K-N-O-W, Nowhere. Nowhere is cool because it has teleportation systems with almost no limits, and it is inhabited by a superpowered dog named Cosmos, who's the chief of security and a close ally of the Guardian. Who we saw in the Guardians movie. It's the dog wearing the spacesuit. Right. I was going to say, yeah. and Cosmos is so important that he appeared in the movie, mm-hmm. and he even has a Funko Pop vinyl figure in his image. He's a little cute doggy. He is. Uh, he is supposedly Russian. the Russian dog that was fired into space, and yep. then I think it's supposed to be the radiation from the same... B- asteroid belt that gave um, the Fantastic Four their powers yep. made him like super smart. And also like launched him into the universe. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. So now he's just like hanging out on nowhere. Following the phalanx, one of the Guardian's first enemies is the Universal Church of Truth, which is <laughs> what, a multi-ethnic what? alien cult church. I believe I have a, uh, um, I'm I'm a registered minister with them. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the idea is just so crazy that I, I just had to bring it up. Okay. <laughs> When they're done with that, they set out to investigate Limbo Ice, as it is referred to, that is floating through space. And they discover a man named Vance Astrovic, (gasps) a.k.a. Major Victory, from the original Guardians of the Galaxy. So this is where the original Guardians cross over into the new Guardians. It's the only place. Is this how they explain their name in the in the universe? Hang on, oh, hang on, okay. hang on. So Vance Astrovic <laughs> is also essentially Captain America because first he was frozen in time. He was frozen and then he went all the way forward to the 20, 31st mm-hmm. century and then he was frozen again and came back to the Captain 21st America century. Yeah. yeah. Like he's really Captain America in space. So yeah. meeting Major Victory and listening to the stories of his adventures with the former team inspired this disparate group of questionably heroic heroes to name themselves the Guardians of the Galaxy. So good call, Jason. All right. 
While the rest of the team went off to battle the Universal Church of Truth again, they left Astro behind on nowhere, only to be attacked by his former teammate, Starhawk. Remember oh, him? Yeah, that, he's the guy that can sense the changes in time, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. So he's kind of, he's coming, to put it in uh, Legends of Tomorrow terms, he's coming back to kill someone who's like, not an aberration, but is messing with the timeline. Got it. And then nowhere is infiltrated by Skrulls while they're fighting, because no, no. why not? During this invasion, it is revealed that Star-Lord had Mantis use her telepathy to convince many of the team members to join with him and uh, found the team in the first place, and it basically destroys their trust in him. Yep. Next, War of Kings happens. Oh, man. Jason, do you know what War of Kings is, or shall I? I do. It's not good. <laughs> it's, War, uh, War of Kings is where uh, Vulcan... The yes. the third Summers brother that is best forgotten, Scott Summers of X Men fame, goes into the universe. He conquers the Shi'ar Empire, mm-hmm. which is this famous alien empire that has the McCran crystal, and he makes them fight the Inhumans. The, the Inhuman led it's it's the Kree Empire led by the Inhumans. Yeah, led by Black Bolt. Black Bolt the is, is King Black Bolt. At yeah, this so time. and so it's the War of Kings. It is not a good storyline. Oh, you don't all. think so? No. Um, it is a famous event because it is the first time the Guardians of the Galaxy, the renewed Nova Corps, Dark Hawk, and the Star Jammers um, team up to fight a threat together. And the Star the Jammers, if you don't time. know, are a team of alien uh, pirates led by uh, Cyclops' father. That's true. The Guardians disbanded after defeating both Vulcan and King Black Bolt, uh, or quelling them, I guess, would probably be more accurate, (laughs) feeling that they could no longer trust each other. And during this time, Adam Warlock and Gamora went to learn more about the Universal Church of Truth. Drax and Phyla went looking for Drax's long-lost companion. Star-Lord answered a distress call from the Kree, and Rocket was the only one left to rebuild the team. Mm -hmm. So, Rocket... Per per his incarnation in the in the movies is a very angry, unsociable character. So I sort of like the idea that he's the one who sort of left to rebuild a new and he puts together a very interesting team, a new proto guardians team. And some of the people that he uh, recruits include Bug, a full grown version of Groot, and Major Victory because boy, we sure can't shake him. Why not? But if you want to help Jason and I from ever losing trust in each other and having to disband forever and a raccoon have to be the one to bring us back together. Oh, man, I don't want that. I don't either. Then head on over to patreon.com slash Jawin, J-A-W-I-I-N, and check out all of the cool stuff that we are making over there. If you throw a little bit of support our way, we will give you such cool rewards as the Geek History Lesson Extra podcast, where today we are going to talk about our predictions for the soon, soon, soon upcoming Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Two movie. You help us keep our McCran crystals lit. You help us keep Cosmos fed on nowhere. And your support really means the world to us. It's and we're just saying that we're doing the prediction episode because we, at the time of this recording, we have not seen the movie. We have not. So. Also, yeah. Yep. Um, so thank you so much to everybody who has already donated. And thank you to everyone who's going to donate in the future. Guys, go over there, please, because it helps improve this podcast so much. It makes a big difference. And we, you might go over there and you might notice that there are some added things. There are some added perks. There's a lot of new stuff over there. That uh, a lot of new content over there, including maybe some podcasts and some videos that you <gasps> only see if you are behind the Patreon wall. So um, yeah, we're trying to you know expand the Geek History Lesson brand out, and we need your help to do that. Patreon.com/slash Jawin. Yes. Now back to the Guardians of the Galaxy. So remember how everybody's off doing their own disparate little things? Sure. Let's talk about that. All right. So Star Lord, we all know him. Yeah, I guess he discovered that Ronan the Accuser had been. Rebuilding the Phalanx's Babel Sphere. Yeah, that makes sense. Spire, I'm sorry. Babel Spire. Yep. It's like a tower. And was trying to preserve the Kree and the Kree Empire under his rule. Ronan got mad that Star-Lord had discovered him and threw Star-Lord into the negative zone so that he could keep building stuff. While in the negative zone, he di- uh, Star-Lord discovered that Blastar... Uh, had crowned himself as king of the negative zone and was planning to invade Earth. Blastar is an old Fantastic Four villain. Great. (laughs) Who basically blasts stuff and gets angry. Yes, he was also called Living Bomb Burst, which I feel like accurately tells you what he does. And his plan to invade Earth involves going through 42. Jason, do you know what 42 is? 42 is the negative zone prison built by Reed Richards and I believe Hank Pym uh, during the Civil War. Yes, uh, actually during the Initiative. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, but, but ha- the first time you see it is Civil yes, War. Um, yeah. To house anti-registration yeah. forces. Mm-hmm. Uh, when Blastar discovered Star-Lord there, he decided that he could use Star-Lord as a way to help his invasion. Sure. And Star-Lord had no choice because he was a prisoner. And when they attacked 42, the non-superpowered guards were easily overtaken. Although Star-Lord was able to contact Mantis, because she's telepathic, and get the Guardians all together and get them teleported into the negative zone to defend the galaxy against Blastar's forces, because that's, you know, kind of their whole deal. Meanwhile, Drax and Phyla, a.k.a. Quasar, had been searching for Drax's missing friend named Heather. And they asked, <laughs> I'm not kidding. I know, Heather. Yep, hey. Drax and Heather, you know? Yeah, Heather. Yeah. Uh, it's like that, it's that great, uh, it's that great Ben Fold song, Drax yeah. and Heather. Drax and Heather. <laughs> and they asked a space seer who told them about the War of Kings instead and eventually revealed that Heather was being held at Oblivion. Jason, do you know what Oblivion is? Uh, I don't, actually. So Oblivion is a cosmic entity and another oh, aspect yeah. of mm, death. Yeah. And Oblivion represents non-existence and is the counterforce for the expanding universe and lives in sort of a black hole, but it's not a black hole because yeah. it's death. I sort of, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, if you didn't, it's okay. Yeah. So Drax and Phyla traveled to Oblivion where they noticed that Phyla wasn't able to use her quantum bands. So the quantum bands are basically bracelets that you wear if you're Quasar and it's where all of your power and your uh, ability to not die in space comes from. Mm-hmm. And so her quantum bands weren't working. So they suspected that they had probably died. Um, but they were going to keep looking for Heather anyway because she had a pretty name. Sure, why not? In their confusion, they were ambushed by Maelstrom, who's an evil inhuman scientist, and fed Phyla to the Dragon of the Moon. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Dragon of the Moon is a space dragon. Don't worry about it's it. It's also my favorite Bruce Lee movie. Yes. Um, Wendell Vaughn, who was a past Quasar, then showed up out of nowhere to save Drax and Phyla, and Phyla was able to burst out of the dragon's stomach because her quantum bands were working after all. She then made a deal with Death to become his new avatar and be allowed back into the universe if she could bring the Dragon of the Moon to Earth with her. Excuse me. And the uh, moon, dragon of the moon, or moon dragon as he's referred to, is part of the Guardians for a little bit and then largely forgotten about. Together, they all return to nowhere and reunited with their former teammates to reform one giant new order um, to prepare for an oncoming attack from the Shi'ar Empire under their new Emperor Vulcan and the Kree, who had, were then led by the Inhumans, including King Black Bolt, which is effectively uh, the end of War of Kings because they... Failed. Which couldn't have ended sooner, soon enough. Yes. So, a long while after this, Thanos, you know him, yep. captured a cosmic cube from the American army, which he used to escape to Moored, uh, which is the homeland of the Badoon. You remember them, the old yep. scroll like mm-hmm. alien race? The original Guardians alien yes. enemies. The Guardians promptly traveled to Avengers Tower to warn the Avengers and lend a hand fighting all of the invading Badoon Thanos people. Thanos then became one with the Cosmic Cube and proceeded to kill the Elders of the Universe, um, which are people like the Collector, mm-hmm. and the Avengers and the Guardians. So he's going to kill all these people. I believe this is the uh, the Avengers. This was in Avengers that the storyline that this is what set up Brian Michael Bendis's. Uh, Guardians. It run. is. This is yeah. what happens right before that yeah. run. Um, however, instead of killing them, because Thanos isn't that good at his job either, he accidentally sent them to the Cancerverse, which is referred oh, to as Reality One Zero Zero One One, instead of killing them. What? Yeah. That's the uh, Cancerverse. I hate. I am. I'm. I'm also fairly certain. I don't know binary very well, but I think One Zero Zero One One. I think it's a joke. Yeah. Um, I think it actually refers mm, to of the, the Cancerverse. Yes. Uh, from there, all the heroes bargain with the Collector uh, that if he gave them a weapon that would help them defeat the Cosmic Cube, basically they would uh, they would let the Elders deal with Thanos. So he gives them a weapon. They accomplish all of this. They return to Earth. They leave Thanos with the Elders to deal with. And Star Lord was like, "Hey, Iron Man, remember how much fun we had together in the Cancerverse and how we didn't die?" Why don't you be a guardian of the galaxy with us? And Tony Stark was like, sure. Mm -hmm. And then then Brian Michael Bendis took over it. And this is what we're going to talk about now. And then they, Iron Man joins the Guardians of the Galaxy for no real reason besides just to sell the title. Exactly. Um, and when you read it, because I did, I revisited it for for this, it's 
weird. It's weird and to have he is Tony out there. of place. Oh yeah, he's way out of yeah. place now. Yeah, yeah. Um, because you know Tony is like this kind of swaggering character, and like he has a similar attitude that you would think of when you're describing Star Lord, but like. You don't need two Star Lords, no. and you certainly don't need two Star Lords when one of them doesn't know Jack anything about traveling in space. Yeah, and that's what Iron Man is. So their next adventure began with Star Lord receiving a letter from his father, who is Jason, King of Spartax. That's J Y S O N. It's a J apostrophe. Oh my bad. Sorry. Sorry. And this message from his father said that the Council of Galactic Empires had decided that Earth was too much of a threat and would be left alone from here on out. Now, that might sound like a good thing to you, but it's bad to you if you're Star-Lord because Star-Lord is actually his rank. He is uh, Peter Quill, the Star-Lord of Spartax, which is like the crown prince. Yep, because if you go back to our Geek History lesson, you learn that he actually got that because he stole it from another dude of Earth. and. In kind of nefarious ways. Yeah. And Star Lord's not a good guy. No. Um, it's kind of like a Green Lantern. So when you're an alien or half an alien, you're not allowed to go to Earth. And uh, Peter Quill's an alien and all the Guardians are aliens except Tony. So this is bad for all of them. It alarmed him so much that he and the Guardians immediately went out into space to protect the planet when they discovered that a bunch of Badoon ships were heading straight towards their planet, which seems convenient. And maybe if you had a brain, you would have thought about The Guardians defeat them by crash landing their ship on Earth, where Drax and Groot are badly injured, and Groot is reduced to a small twig. This turned out to be a ruse by Jason of Spartax, and the Guardians were arrested by Galactic Police under his orders and taken to a prison ship and locked up. But since Groot could not be arrested because he was literally like a little twig planted in a a, a pot, uh, this gave him time to grow back to his full size very quickly and free everyone. That's what happens when you use fertilizer, kids. It's actually really sweet because um, when they're trying to get back, when they're trying to get back to their ship and sort of save themselves right before they're arrested, um, Rocket like makes a very big deal about making sure that he finds a piece of Groot and that it gets planted so that he can grow back. Because if not, they don't know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a nice, it's an unexpectedly nice moment amidst this giant action scene. It also makes you wonder if um, if that Brian Michael Bendis specifically did that moment. Because he read the movie script? I think so. Yeah, I don't, that's what I, I don't think, think that that just happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it's too coincidental. I mean, we haven't done a lesson on Groot yet, although it has been uh, heavily requested. Look, I'm going to be honest, guys. I don't know if there's enough on Groot to do a lesson. I mean, if, look, if we're doing a Groot lesson, it's just going to be an hour of I am Groot. I am Groot. That's the only way I am Groot. one does it. I am Groot. Keep going. I am Groot. <laughs> I am Groot. I am Groot. I am Groot. It's going to be that yeah. for 45 minutes. Yeah. If you want that lesson, just let us know. We have like 10 requests for it. Oh, my God. Uh, so Groot frees everyone. <laughs> the Guardians of the Galaxy found their weapons because they're literally hanging right upside their cells and stole a battleship, which they escaped in and returned to their job guarding planet Earth that nobody asked them to do. During this time, they intercepted someone who is heading towards Earth at high speeds. And this was revealed to be Angela. Jason, who's Angela? (sighs) (laughs) Oh, man, listeners, if you can see his face. This this lesson has made me sigh so much. Um, Angela is an Image Comics character created by Todd McFarlane and Neil Gaiman. She appears in an issue of Spawn. Um, she is originally an angel that is he- uh, that is sent to kill spawns because spawns are creations of the devil. Now, in a long and ridiculous custody battle, Neil Gaiman sued uh, Todd McFarlane for the use of Angela because the idea, apparently, I learned is that Angela shows up in Spawn a lot. Mm-hmm. And uh, I might be paraphrasing some of this and getting no, some no, no, please, please, but please. Neil Gaiman. Um, was like, whoa, I only wanted her to appear in that one issue that I wrote because Tom McFarlane did this period of time on Spawn where he let other writers write Spawn. Like yes. Frank Miller wrote an issue, uh, the Cerebus creator, David Sim, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and Frank, uh, Frank Miller wrote an issue, David Sim. Neil Gaiman was one of those. Grant Morrison wrote one. Um, and Neil Gaiman was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I create every If I create something, it's mine. And so he sued Todd McFarlane, basically won um, – Angela was removed from the Spawn universe, and then for some reason, Neil Gaiman sold Angela to Marvel. And so then in that uh, Age of Ultron event, Angela pops into the 
Marvel Universe. Why? Because she's absolutely not needed. That's why. Yeah. They and get, it's one of the most re- – I, I just – you don't need Angela in the Marvel Universe. They attempt to explain it in her first issue appearance of Guardians. Oh, and, I bet they do. And she, her internal narrative claims that somebody – uh, forced her out of heaven, and she thinks they're on Earth, so she's going to go destroy Earth. Yeah, that makes sense. That that really helps Marvel Universe. Yeah, so the Guardians initially believe her to be a threat. So, of course, they capture her and fight her on the moon. Yeah, that makes sense. And they were finally able to defeat her on the moon, but it took all of them working together to do so because she's, like, really strong and has the power of God and stuff. Yep. Eventually, though, it became evident that she wasn't a threat, although if it takes all of you to beat somebody up, like, maybe they're a threat. Uh, so the Guardians of the Galaxy decide to let her go to Earth, but they went along as a chaperone to keep an eye on her. So the next place the Guardians appear after this is during the trial of Jean Grey. Ugh. Oh, yeah. Strap in. If you want to know more about Jean Grey, we have a lesson on it. Yeah, we do. We just did it. So when a group of rogue Shi'ar soldiers attacked the past X-Men and took young Jean Grey with them and put her on trial for the actions of her future self, the Guardians of the Galaxy rushed to the nearest Shi'ar ship that they could find on Earth, which was docked in Canada because they thought that that's where she would be. Yeah. When they arrived there, uh, they learned from the X-Men that beat them there because, you know, the X-Men are faster than the space people. Uh, that it was too late and the ship was gone. The past X-Men and Kitty Pride join up with the Guardians of the Galaxy, and they all went in pers- into space in pursuit of Jean together. In space, they teamed up with the Star Jammers, who Jason talked about a little bit earlier, yep. and everybody managed to help Jean Grey escape by the power of working together. The Guardians and the Star Jammers then escorted the past X-Men back to Earth, all except for Scott Summers, who decided to travel through space with the Star Jammers and learn more about his father. With his dad. That's actually a really sweet arc. It's okay. Um, I don't love X-Men in space, but I love the moment for the two characters. Mm-hmm. Not long after this, Agent Venom, who is Flash Thompson working for S.H.I.E.L.D. Wearing the Venom symbiote from Spider-Man. Yeah. Joined the Guardians as a proxy for the Avengers, and together they all fought the Spar Toy, which is another alien race, and its allies. In a... In order to battle the Spar Toy, the Guardians bring in Captain Marvel as well as a ringer. Captain Marvel, of course. Carol Danvers. Carol Danvers. Yes. Um, and she knew them from having saved Star-Lord from Jason a couple stories ago. Star-Lord and Captain Marvel went around through space and gathered all the rest of the Guardians from wherever they'd been doing stuff. Uh, Rocket had been captured by the Kree. Gamora was put into an arena with the Badoon. Drax had been put on trial by the Shi'ar because they were like, well, we didn't get our Jean Grey trial, so we'll do Drax. Groot was abandoned to die on Rigel 8 by the Brood. Rigel 8's a tough place. And uh, Venom was hiding out on nowhere, having recently escaped from the scrolls. So, with the help of Captain Marvel, they rebuilt the Guardians like 10 minutes after having just done so. During this time, Star Lord was elected as the leader of the Spar Toy, which he declined, electing instead to stay as the leader of the Guardians. So, the Spar Toy do this thing where if you defeat their leader, they have a pretend election and they vote you into power. Well, you automatically win. Like, there's a lot of cultures that have yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the but but the fact that they have a fake election about it is what I think is particularly oh. funny. <laughs> like they pretend like it's a vote, but like it's going to be you because you just killed their king or whatever. In the wake of this, Star Lord decided to hide out, and a bunch of assassins were sent to kill him while in search of the mysterious Black Vortex. He was eventually captured by his father Jason again, uh, masquerading as Mister Knife, the master of the Slaughter Squad. Although was eventually freed by his girlfriend, Kitty Pride, who convinced him to steal the Black Vortex himself in order to annoy his father. Together, they discovered what the Black Vortex actually was, in fact. And the Black oh, Vortex, the Black Vortex. Oh, is God. a mirror with the ability to unleash an individual's <sighs> full cosmic potential. So they stole it from Jason and turned to the Guardians and the X-Men for guidance. Because they're like, we have this thing. What do we do with this thing? I don't know what's going on with this thing. Let's look Why into it. Why did we steal this? And get new costumes. to piss off his dad. Great. Yeah, they do get new costumes. That's true. Yeah. Uh, during a bladdle, uh, during a bladdle, jeez. 
During a battle for ownership of the Black Vortex against the Slaughter Squad, Gamora submitted to its power and it enhanced her abilities, allowing the X-Men and the Guardians to escape to Spartax's moon. Star-Lord wanted them all to submit to the Black Vortex so that they could be super powerful, and Kitty Pride argued against that. And in the end, Beast and Angel submitted to it, but they, along with Gamora, end up corrupted, unable to control themselves, and turn on their allies. Although it's this, a real monkey's paw. Yeah, although this is where um, Young Angel gets his fire wings. Which is really, really cool, yeah, so it's almost worth now. it. Yeah. Uh, they then escaped with the Black Vortex to Star-Lord's ship, which during this time was called the Bad Boy. And soon met back up with the Star Jammers who offered to help and guide them. Jason later recovered the Black Vortex from the good guys and used it on his ally named Thane, who then encased the entire planet of Spartax in an amber shield that trapped the citizens in suspended animation. This was part of Jason's deal with the Brood that provided the Brood with host bodies that they would need in order to reproduce. And the Brood are an alien... um race that are kind of like the xenomorphs in the alien franchise they're an x-men villain Mm -hmm. and then you know they kind of burst out of you and stuff like that and yeah they need human bodies they're 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 basically they're 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 basically the xenomorphs from aliens and also uh if you don't know thane is the son of thanos oh i didn't know that. yeah thane is son of thanos oh well good to know so so the guardians ultimately got back the black vortex from jason and kitty pride wound up using it to phase through the amber shield and save the inhabitants of spartax while simultaneously managing to not succumb to its corruption because she is the goodest of them all at the end of the black vortex event star lord proposed to kitty pride and she accepted and it was so cute During Secret Wars, when the multiverses were destroyed and new versions of all these characters were created, the Guardians reappeared with no memories of their previous selves except for Gamora. And she was one of the only characters to question God Emperor Doom and not recognize him as the leader that he wanted to be worshipped as. Inside the Doom world, like, oh, okay, got it. Yes. Now... I'm going to put a little pause here because sure. we do have an upcoming episode on Gamora. Okay, so we'll so talk we about will this more. explain more about this in the Gamora episode because all of the Guardian stuff, pretty much from Secret Wars on, very heavily is led by her character. I have a feeling that the reason why she could sense the previous universe is because of her Thanos blood. That's probably a good call. All right. Uh, so since then, the Guardians have enjoyed both solo series for pretty much every single character and an ongoing series written by Brian Michael Mendes. And they have the new movie that is about to come out. And this is where we are going to end our lesson they on also the Guardians a, of the Galaxy. They also have a new comic book coming out uh, that is written by Jerry Duggan and drawn by a friend of the podcast, Aaron Cooter. Oh, that's true. Yeah. He Good is, he is, call. He is now doing the art for that. They also have an animated series. They do have an animated series. So but, if you want... But go read that comic book. Support Aaron Cooter because... Uh, uh, those new Guardians of the Galaxy contest uh, costumes he designed look are, amazing. They're pretty, I think Star Lord's new costume is pretty sweet. Yeah. So cool. Well, then uh, that's the end. And shall we move on to recommended reading? Let's go into recommended reading. This is the section of the podcast where if you weren't confused by all that Guardians of the Galaxy yeah. nonsense <laughs> and you want to read just specifically the good stories of the Guardians of the Galaxy, you can go to geekhistorylesson.com slash recommended reading and we have a full list going all the way back to episode one of all the stuff we recommended in our podcast you guys click on that take your right to amazon you can buy that book and when you do that make sure you buy the books over there because a little percentage of that comes back helps us with our hosting costs helps us with our mic costs helps us with our buying headache pills when the continuity is confusing costs Make sure you go do that. Yes. So the first thing I'm going to recommend is Annihilation. That is the giant Cosmic Key Cosmic Key event that basically allowed the contemporary Guardians to exist at all. It is a really good event. You don't need to know a lot going into it. So pick up Annihilation. Start at the beginning. After that, I'm going to suggest that you follow it up with Guardians of the Galaxy, the Abnett and Landing Omnibus. Oh, it is man. everything they ever wrote on yep. the Guardians of the Galaxy in one convenient place. And then end that off with a little modern twist. Pick up uh, the Marvel Now Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1 Cosmic Avengers. This is the Brian Michael Bendis, Steve McNiven first volume. It is fun. It is Iron Man's part of the team. Iron Man is part of the team, which is weird, but it is closer to the film version than any of the other books listed here. So a great place to jump on. Cool. All right. And now we're going to move into discussion. Yes. So, Jason, I do want to ask you. Sure. 
Uh, you know stuff about the Guardians. Sure. You've seen the Guardians movie. Sure. I feel like this is a Game of Thrones question. Who what? is your preferred Guardian of the Galaxy? Like, who's the one I like the best? Yeah, who do you think is the best character? Oh, my God. Um, I mean, how can it be any other answer than Star-Lord? I mean, be it could be, be whatever you want. I mean, well, because here's the problem with that. I kind of feel that, and this is definitely from the, I think is a lot implied from the movies, um, all the rest of the characters are sort of archetypes that serve just his will. I mean, I would also say that, um, I mean, Star-Lord is, I mean, he's Han Solo Redux. He is. He is. But <laughs> even with Han Solo Redux, you get enough of a character that like, oh, this is a guy with some daddy issues mm-hmm. who is like always out to prove something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Drax got a little bit of Annihilation because a lot of it was he was hunting down like the murderers of his family and mm-hmm. stuff like that. So you get a little bit of that. And you saw a little bit of that in the movie. But once you get past Revenge, like what is there? Like Gamora is the same thing. Like I'm, I'm really excited for her lesson that you got mm-hmm. coming down the pipe. Uh, like I hope there's something more to her, but she kind of seems the same way. Like she's just like I'm just crazy green woman. Groot's Who a hates g- her dad? Groot's a guy that says Groot, and Rocket's just the a, a furry Howard the Duck. So <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, I, I can't pick anybody besides Star. Can I pick Cosmos? Because that's the person sure, I would pick. Sure, pick Cosmo. Cosmos yeah. just seems cool and full of adventure. And man, if we could have a series called Nowhere set on that station and the weird adventure, like make it the, like just like the day to day of Cosmo. Make it the weird Deep Space Nine of the Marvel Universe. Call it Nowhere, and it stars Cosmos. Marvel can hire Jason and I at any time to yep. write the series. Yeah. <laughs> um. I, I don't know because Star Lord's the only real character of the Guardians. Mm-hmm. I am in, in my opinion because a lot of his storylines are all about like who's my dad yeah yeah yeah. see i think that's interesting because i feel like i feel the guardians do suffer from the same problem um that you brought up i don't feel like they're well flushed out characters um they're fun and they're archetypical enough that we'll go with it and if you make someone the last of their race then that it like instantly makes them a more interesting character and that's what i mean with the exception of um Peter Quill and, and Drax to a certain extent. Like, that's what they all are. Yeah. Now, they could have done something awesome if they would have added Vance Astro to the team mm-hmm. and simply made him... Uh, they could have done something... Uh, if you flipped his origin, make him from the 31st century, yeah. but make him a reverse Captain America. So he gets locked in some time capsule and he wakes up. He gets shot through time mm-hmm. and he wakes up in the 21st century. So he's stuck in our period, but yeah. he's from the future. And so he doesn't understand. He thinks like we're all cavemen and savages. And then give him Captain America's shield, but give him the triangle shield. Mm-hmm. So like, so when Captain America meets him, it's not we just have Captain America's shield, but you'd be like, oh, yes, sir. I found this in the future and I made this from your circular shield. Yeah. So it's kind of the same. But that way, like even that might make the team a little bit more interesting, like having him on the team, but you, but not in his current origin. You have to flip it. But I do, I do understand how if you are the movie people, you're like, we're not doing another frozen you can't, guy. You can't, no you way. Can't do, you can't do it in the movie. But I'm just saying for the comic books, like he, yeah. he might be – he might make something interesting. Also, he, I'll even – I'll make it even more interesting. Uh, gender bend it. Sure. Make it a major victory, Mm -hmm. and she's an ancestor of Steve Rogers. No. Or um, descendant. She's a descendant. She's She's a descendant. Of Steve Rogers. That'd be cool, especially if you made her, like, look nothing like, you know, everyone's... Well, give her the same look that Major, like, he, she's weird, like, blobby Starfield girl. Oh, no, I mean, like, don't make her white. Like, you yeah, know yeah. how everybody says about the future that, like, people are just going to be gray? Yeah. Like, yeah, like, find the most ethnically ambiguous, mm-hmm. or, or, or draw her that way. Well, I'm saying, like, you never, never need to see her skin ever. Like, she is just... Oh, really? She's Starfield girl, like, weirdo. Like, in the future, oh. people people are cosmic-y, oh, super-powered you mean the character weirdos. from A-Force? Who's like a cosmic y No. Oh, sorry. No, not at all. I'm I'm saying gender bend major victory. Yeah. Who cares if we I don't need to see her skin. Yeah, but major victory wears a costume. Well, I'm saying like make yeah, that yeah, her yeah. that's her skin. Yeah, but there's a character in A Force who looks like a Starfield. Oh, never read A Force. Yeah, yeah. So uh it was she's she was really pretty and she was on the cover and I think she's dead all right, now. Cool. Um I think that's interesting because um I don't really Do you have ha- a favorite character by I the way? I don't. Okay. Um and I was gonna say that I think that I think giving all these characters solo series is both premature and the right thing to do. I think it is premature because I think they're characters that like utterly lack definition. Yeah. Um, I know that uh, the Rocket Raccoon series that Scotty Young did is like really fun. Yeah. But it doesn't add a ton to who Rocket 
is. Well, let me let me. Um, but but I oh, think sure. I think the Guardians, um, like a lot of comic book characters that that people would consider like quote lower tier, they're best together. Yo, one hundred percent. I mean, you said way back in the bygone days of our Big Hero Six episode that your favorite character was the big was Big Hero Six. So I feel like my favorite character is the Guardians of the Galaxy. Like they're all better together as opposed to separate. Oh, okay. But I honestly think the most interesting character is uh, is Nebula. Who's not really a part of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Who's not, but appears in all of their stories. And is, is a, when we get to Gamora, she's a big part of that. Yeah. But I like the idea that like Thanos built himself a daughter um, and she's not good enough. And I think there's a lot of interesting stuff to be mined there. Uh-huh. Um, as opposed to, I don't think Gamora is uninteresting, certainly. But Gamora is just um, his slave. I mean, I agree with you that like all of these characters having solo series is a little ridiculous, especially Star Lord. Like Star Star Lord's book is Guardians of the Galaxy, so if, like to yeah. spin him off into a solo series, it's just like um, okay. Well, that's and then he marries with... Kitty Pride in that solo, and you're just like, what? Yeah, um, that doesn't exist in my head, can it? I, it doesn't exist in mine, just because I just think it's ridiculous. Um, but um, I don't know. It's it's weird. Let me now. Let me say Devil's Advocate. Just, uh, I don't agree with this point, but I'm just going to say it just for the the terms of the discussion. Sure, sure, sure. Do you think having the Guardians have solo series is to expand the characters a little bit more? Right, I do, I do. So, like, like I said, I feel like it's premature because I, I feel like they're they are lacking definition. But so, um, especially when you think about it from a larger franchise perspective, and these are going to be a hugely important part of your cinematic universe. That's a great way to give them definition. Yeah, the Guardians Galaxy book's not going anywhere anytime um, soon. And they've obviously been very successful because yeah. every character has. At least one volume, if not two or three now? I don't know about that because a lot of them have been canceled. Like, there's no Star-Lord series right now. There's no Groot series right now. There's no Drax series. Well, no, there is a Drax series. The Drax series Drax? is now. Drax and Gamora, Gamora are, like, are the are ones now, that are on now. Because I think they're doing them in waves. Yeah. So, um, like, I don't know about that because if Star-Lord was, like, uber successful, wouldn't they still be publishing it? Right. That, and the, see, and then there's an interesting question. But I feel I feel like it is – I understand why you do it. And I think if they're going to become important characters – I mean, they already are important characters. Sure. Um, that it's the right thing to do. But I, I feel like I don't know how successful it's ultimately been. And that's something that we won't be able to tell – Till five or ten years down the line. Yeah. But I did think it was interesting, like, how quickly we went from absolutely – because I was working in a shop and I watched it happen. Um, how quickly we went from, like, nothing to, like, the Guardians – there was, like, six Guardians Shoved book at one time. Throats, yeah. yeah. Um, which, you know, sometimes means when you're, when you're releasing things as a shotgun blast as opposed to a sniper bullet, um, not all of it is great. Nope. Um, unfortunately. But some of it is. Yeah. And when it's great, it's really great. So, look, the good thing about the best thing about the the Guardians of the Galaxy movie is that I would say is that now there are actual good Guardians of the Galaxy comic book stories. Mm-hmm. Now, I would argue that Annihilation before the movie, yeah, yeah, yeah. was a good Guardians of the Galaxy storyline. But I'll say because of that in the solo series, there are now more. Yes, there's more it, than there's ever been. Yes, and there used to be none. Yeah. In my opinion, like not a single good storyline of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Well, it used to be Annihilation and Well, I'm saying before Annihilation, oh, sure. like there was yeah. nothing. No, yeah, like absolutely not. you just couldn't read it. It was a it was a mess. Yeah. So. And you and you would have to there's no collection either of the classic Guardians. There's you a have reason to, why. You would have to piece Well, they never they had a couple issues of their own book, but you had to piecemeal it together from all of their like Fantastic 4 cameo appearances. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Uh, shall we move on to the teaching tweet? Yes, the teaching tweet where Professor Ashley in 140 characters or less, just like you do on Twitter, will condense the Guardians of the Galaxy down to a funny and sarcastic tweet that you can see when we tweet it at Geek History Lesson on Twitter at GHL Podcast. <clears throat> Guardians of the Galaxy. Like the Legends of Tomorrow, they're kind of the worst at their job, but we love them for it. And then a little heart emoji. And Aww. then a little star emoji. Yo. Yo. Yeah. That was great. Thank you. Cool. Well, I was uh, equally confused and uh, repulsed and, and excited <laughs> equally at this lesson of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, that's really cool. Guys, don't forget you can always go download and subscribe to our podcast on Audio Boom, iTunes, and SoundCloud. And if you go over to iTunes, please leave us a rating and a review. Because you know what? 
this is the school. This is a mind university. And you may be at this point like, hey, guys, you're asking me to do too much. You want me to go get a T-shirt? You want me to go to the recommended reading? You want me to go to iTunes and have some, star something? Have some freaking school pride, guys. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> you are our students, and we need you to be involved because good and students are involved. So go over there leave a rating, leave a review because we need to educate the masses about pop culture because they don't know about it. They don't know about these terrible Guardians of the Galaxy runs. <laughs> what could possibly be more important than Guardians of the Galaxy? They need to know. They need to know about this stuff. They can also find out about this stuff at our website, of course, geekhistorylesson.com, where all our recommended reading is. It's and also, so beautiful. And also our uh, patreon.com slash jawin at J-A-W-I-I-N, where you can listen to our Geek History Lesson episode all about uh, our prediction for Guardians of the Galaxy 2 because we have not seen it. And actually, if they want to suggest a future lesson, where on social media can they do that? They can do that at facebook.com slash geekhistorylesson and on Twitter at GHL Podcast. There is a panoply of ways to get in contact with us in both of those places. Come find us on Twitter at Jawin, J-A-W-I-I-N, and at Ashley V. Robinson for Ashley. I have been... Jason, your ever-loving Star-Lord Inman. I am Ashley Victoria Robinson. And Professor Ashley, will you please steer this ship towards the conclusion? Class is now dismissed.